All righty. Hi, I'm Taryn. Welcome to our special librarianship pathway Q&A with our advisors. Today's workshop is part of our pathway series introducing the different MLIS career pathways, where you will get an inside perspective from instructors who have worked in specific fields. Today, we'll be talking about skill sets that prepare students for work in special libraries. So let's get started with the agenda. Today's agenda consists of an overview of the special librarianship pathway, which courses students can consider, how students use the skill set, and then we'll meet faculty with expertise in this area who have made themselves available to answer your questions. So what is special library? Special libraries, also called information centers, knowledge resource centers, or a variety of similar names are information focused units that support the strategic goals of the organization within which they are based. So for example, law and medical libraries. Here are the core theory and knowledge sets for the pathway. But regardless of the job title and professional label, information professionals are connected by their focus on managing and applying the data, information, and knowledge required in their setting. They take a holistic view of the role of information and knowledge in organizations and communities, and they are concerned with information and knowledge through all stages of their life cycle. Foundational recommend courses such as these, which you can go to the website for specific topics. And now I'll turn it over to Sheila. Thanks a lot, Taryn. So referencing the special librarianship career pathway list of foundational and recommended courses, let's just take a look at an example of how to form a narrowed list of electives specific to your interests and the skills that you want to build. Info 282 Seminar in Library Management is one of the courses with multiple topics recommended on this pathway. And MLIS students may take up to nine units of Info 282 with different content. Now you can use the Advising Toolkits Classes to Comps tool shown on the right-hand side um, to pull down a list of comp a comprehensive list of all of the Info 282 seminar topics. And from here, you'll see the corresponding uh, MLIS competencies and course learning outcomes are displayed. So if you're developing your wish list of your 27 units of electives, from here, you can jot down the comps that are covered by this specific seminar topic, as in this case, using social media for competitive and company research. Afterwards, check the MLIS rotations tool to find out when this specific topic is on offer across fall, spring, and summer terms. And then you can visit the instructor syllabus to learn even more detailed information about readings, skills, and projects in this particular class. Now, the MLIS special session rotation tool will show that this topic is available every summer. You can visit the summer schedule of classes to find the instructor's name and then visit their syllabus to decide if this class should help you meet your career goals. Now, if you need individual help in working with any of our advising tools, you're certainly able to schedule personalized Zoom meetings with me to receive coaching on how to use all of our advising tools. Now, in tandem with studying the recommended and foundational special librarian pathway courses, you'll want to take a deep dive into additional resources that the iSchool provides you to help you formulate your career launch action plan. Now, one of these, the annual MLIS Skills at Work report, contains curated information for job seekers specific to special library settings and job functions. Notice the report um, found a few noteworthy trends pertinent to this discussion today. Number one, the jobs analysis found 3% job growth over the previous year for LIS skills in the business sector. Number two, 34% of government jobs in the analysis were in the Metro DC area. And number three, 30% of the business sector jobs are offered as remote positions. Note that the reports pages 23 through 33 will overview different job titles in different job function areas from web services, user experience, and social media to data management and analysis and everything in between. 
and suggested skills are also listed. So it's really worth your time to browse the pages where job data is pulled out by the specific organization or industry type. For example, medical, pharmaceutical, and health science, or legal, which covers both academic, government, and private practice settings. As you progress through choosing your electives, don't forget about all the resources and supports available to you as you expand your professional network. Now, Special Library Association's student chapter here at the iSchool works very hard to provide guest speakers, blog content, tours of special libraries, and opportunities for your leadership involvement. Our community profile series, which is broken down by career pathway, our alumni career spotlights database and LinkedIn searches are all fantastic ways for you to find more about career pathways and special libraries and corporate information workplaces. Now, some of our alumni who have filled out their career spotlight page have also included their contact information. So you may be able to reach them for an informational interview and learn more about the steps that help them find their way to their current position. Sarah and Stacy, pictured on the right, each work in non-traditional LIS settings. And you can read about SLA leader Lauren Keim, who worked as an intern in the Muppets archive. You can also proactively create job alerts for targeted industries and positions on the SLA jobs board, even as a beginning MLIS student through Indeed or other job search aggregators for special keywords. So you can keep an eye on the types of positions in special library and corporate settings that are available in your area. Now, here's an example of a law firm position in New York with a salary over 100,000, and they are asking for five years experience in libraries and an MLIS. Now, you can also regularly try our SJSU Handshake database, which you'll all have access to throughout your time in, uh, as a student through your one.sjsu account. And all the job announcements that come into the iSchool are directed over to the SJSU Handshake service, which is a database that all of our students and our alumni have access to for their job search. There are other recommended job sites in our career development resource on our iSchool homepage. You can read um, those sample job descriptions and keep track of the knowledge, skills, and abilities listed in your targeted position types. Finally, don't forget to tap into all the great career supports that iSchool has put into place for you. Have some of them listed on the slide here. Now, a good way to organize your efforts is to make use of the career planning checklist inside your student success planner. iSchool's career coach, Kim Doherty, also has a background in independent information work, and she's just a great resource um, for this pathway in particular. And now you have the great opportunity to hear tips and recommendations from our experts in this pathway. Four professors of our iSchool Special Librarianship Pathway are here to, um, to help you out with questions today. Each of them have decades of experience in law, corporate, medical, and other special library environments, a dream team. And we wanna thank you all for being with us today. First, they are going to introduce themselves and let you know a little bit about their background with the pathway. Uh, of course, the skills and topics that they feel are most timely, as well as a little bit about the courses they teach from this pathway. And then later on, we'll be opening it up for Q&A with all of our panelists. So I'll um, kick it over to you, Scott. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you, Sheila. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today. So my name is Scott Brown. My pronouns are he, him, uh, and I am currently a senior cyberian uh, with Oracle Incorporated, a large software firm, um, and I'm based in Portland, Oregon, and I am also an instructor at San Jose State, uh, uh, adjunct instructor um, in these different courses here. So, um, so a little bit about my 
path here and current setting and then and then a little bit of guidance from me. So um, so I am actually a part of the alumni community as well. I graduated in December of 1999, uh, but I've been in corporate library settings in particular and in research in particular for uh, 20 years, which is, has been an amazing time. Um, so, but, uh, you know, I've been in this role, but I've certainly, I started out in public settings um, in the Santa Cruz Public Library. I've worked in academic settings and worked in corporate settings, which which I actually really enjoy uh, for a variety of different reasons, but have also been a trainer speaker. You see, I actually wrote a book on finding information in social media as well. Um, and then these are the different courses that um, I currently teach. Um, so information technology, web 2.0 and social media, social media and competitive intelligence um, with my uh, friend and colleague, Christy Confetti Higgins. I also teach information vendor landscape, which is kind of a specialized um, course. A lot of folks fall into this um, where they're working with information vendors. And so we talk about, you know, how do you think about these resources? What are the kind of questions that you need to think about? How do you work with vendors? What's vendor perspective? All of that kind of content is in there. And then marketing your LIS skills in a networked world is kind of my longest running course. Um, I'm going to talk, come back to those and kind of share a few learnings, particularly from that one in just a second, but just to talk about my current setting. So our team currently, um, Oracle is a global company. It's a very large company. It's, I want to say, 135,000 people globally. So it's a lot of folks to serve. We are a fairly small team, uh, which we informally call the virtual library. Um, I believe there are four of us, five of us kind of five extended team. Um, but part of what we do, we're an entirely distributed team in ourselves. So we all work remotely. Um, we are based across the US. Uh, big focus of mine is on-demand research and research services, but we also, also do curation, information management, data analysis, measurement. Um, and you know, one of the things we're focusing on right now is trying to understand what our research services are gonna look like over the next three years or so. Um, so um, it's, it's really exciting work. Um, thank you for, for switching the slide. Um, and what what one of the things I really enjoy about it is that it really is continuous learning. Um, in the marketing your skills in a network world course, we talk about the current job market, all the different um, uh, kind of positions that are out there uh, and where your skills can apply. We talk a lot about transferable skills. Um, and in fact, um, First of all, the MLS, MLAS Skills at Work report that was mentioned earlier, that is a fantastic report. And thank you for everyone who puts that out because it really does look at how your skills map to what's currently out there. And that is incredibly important to understand because even if you haven't had a lot of direct and specific library and information experience, you bring a, a lot of transferable skills that you can combine with those to apply really effectively to, to a lot of different positions. Um, I'll share a very quick story. I was just recently meeting with a data analyst at our company who is a developer, data analyst, very hardcore technical person. That, and we were talking about the title Cyberian. And, um, you know, in a lot of instances, I feel like I have to kind of explain what it is that what the value we kind of bring to the organization. But this person, she just got it. She's like, I understand that completely. All information and data is about structure. It's about tagging. It's about identification. It's about what information is in there. And it was really refreshing to hear that, to be quite honest. Um, and so, you know, it. one of the things we emphasize in the course is the importance of understanding how your skills map to a lot of different positions. Um, so just to share a few things from that um, is number one, the importance of networking. Um, you know, professional associations can be a great resource for networking, ALA, SLA, uh, Medical Library Association, ACIST, AA, Law Librarianship, uh, SKIP, all of these are great organizations in order to connect with professionals um, who are doing work in areas that are of interest to you and ways to potentially get insights and get some advantage in looking for, looking for jobs out there. Um, but just to share a, a quick piece before I turn it over um, to the next speaker is, um, it's really important, I think, to kind of expand your comfort zone. And that's one of the things we talk about in the course um, and really being open to what comes your way. Um, one of the ways that I got into research was I did my practicum through San Jose State um, and was working on web 
design or website updates um, with the library and they had a research position come open, which I had taken one course through San Jose State and that was it. Um, but they knew me, they knew my work and they asked me to do that and I was very open to it and I said yes to that. And so it led me on a, a long and very interesting journey, um, which has been really, really satisfying. But I encourage you to you know, be bold, be courageous, be open. Um, one of the most important things to do, and this is advice again from one of my first mentors, is don't disqualify yourself. Job listings are literally wish lists. There is no one who fits those descriptions exactly. But if you can match your skills and your experience to some part of that or key parts of that, um, go ahead and apply for it. Um, you just never know what what kind of uh, response you may get. Um, and let let the person who is doing the hiring disqualify you rather than you disqualify yourself in advance. So um, with that, um, I'll go ahead and turn it over to the next speaker. Okay, great. Crystal. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And I'm delighted that you're all here with us today. Uh, I think I'll start with a little bit of background information about who I am and where I've been and how I got here with you today. Um, my undergraduate degree was a bachelor's in fine arts in the School of Architecture from the Rhode Island School of Design. And I worked in the architectural field for about five years before I decided that it was time to switch gears and I went into librarianship. And so I went to what used to be known as Rosary College, but is now Dominican University and received my MLIS. And that unbelievably was 30 years ago. And so I have been a special librarian ever since, since day one of my working, working career. And I have loved it. I've worked in SciTech, as well as uh, corporate librarianship. And um, I can tell you that it is very different from public, academic, and school. And it's really a unique and special kind of librarianship. But at the same time, no two special libraries are the same either. So thank you for switching the slide. I'm going to share with you about Info 231, which is Special Libraries and Information Centers. And this is a great class to really kind of understand the basics of what overall special librarianship is. Special librarians are found in all kinds of for-profit, non-profit, governmental agencies. You'll find us in prisons. You'll find us in government agencies like NASA, in the FBI, you will find us in news organizations. You will also find us in many corporations, just like you'll find Scott at Oracle. And where I worked uh, until I just recently retired was with Lindy AG, the largest industrial gas company globally. You will also find us in museums, hospitals, law firms, um, all kinds of places, Disney, for example. And so in this particular course, we have six basic units of study where, first of all, we really delve into what it means to be a special librarian and what is the special library environment in general, because like I said, every environment is slightly different from the next. We'll talk specifically about management in a special library environment. For example, you may be the only librarian in an entire organization, as was the case when I first started. I was the only librarian in a 10,000 employee organization. And so automatically you are the ex expert on everything information related. Um, but in addition to that, you are not working just as a library. You are one team or your library is one team of many teams that are supporting the goals of the parent organization, okay? So it's really kind of a different management structure. Uh, we also get into marketing and measuring because these are very important skills that are required in a special library environment. We talk about risk management and you get the opportunity to learn about risks in a global uh, uh, 
situation. You, you actually get to study about an international library or an international risk that needs to be managed. And then we also have a unit where you learn about all kinds of different avenues you can go down um, in the special library realm. Digital asset management, knowledge management, being an independent information professional, that would be someone who either contracts themselves out to different libraries, or they may actually own their own information business, okay? Very different kind of thing. And then we also spend a good bit of time learning about future trends, how to track them, and how to consider whether or not they will impact your library. Within this course, we also have a great opportunity for networking. Scott already mentioned networking, and I'm going to reiterate the value of networking within the special library um, field. With my class, you have the opportunity to interview a practitioner. You will also have an opportunity to network with practitioners to really have engaging conversations with those who are already in the field. And then the final project for the class is a field work project where you'll spend about 20 hours working on a project within a special library. So you get a little flavor of what a special library is like. So some of the highlights in the course are that we have weekly interviews that I record with practitioners and share out to the class. So you can listen to a museum librarian or listen to a pharmaceutical librarian and learn from them. We also have podcasts that are shared. Um, we also have one optional live event, which is always recorded, which shares with you from a practitioner what he goes through when, from his point of view in hiring in a new special librarian to his team. So it will give you some insights in how to apply for jobs. Um, we also focus on building that network and a reminder to you that this particular course is only offered in the summer, so keep, keep that in mind. I have a link on this slide for you to an, a chapter in a book that if you are interested in special librarianship, but you're not sure if this is your path, I encourage you to read that chapter because it goes a little bit more in depth into what special librarianship is. And this may help you decide whether or not it's something that you would like to explore. Before I finish, I'd like to spend just a moment sharing with you about the um, other course that I teach. It's Info 282, but it's for knowledge management. It's simply a one unit, four week course that covers the basics of what knowledge management is. And it is different from information management because now we're talking about knowledge instead of information, but the skills that you learn becoming an information professional are extremely transferable. And in my, in my view, preferred for becoming a knowledge manager. And um, so it, you can learn more about that in that course if you're interested. And with that, I think I'll go ahead and turn it over to our next speaker. Thank you so much, Vicki Steiner. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Vicki Steiner. And just looking at the attendee list, I see lots of familiar names. So I'm happy to see everybody. I think many of you I have may have uh, interacted with you at some point in Info 203 as you started your tenure here at iSchool. So I hope that your studies have been going well. Um, so a little bit of background about me, and then I'll talk about the courses that I teach and some other um, tips that I have for careers in law librarianship. So my background, I started out, um, I obtained my law degree 20 years ago. And um, initially, once I obtained my law degree at UCLA. I worked at a boutique law firm where I specialized in intellectual property, property and also um, counseling nonprofit organizations and social justice issues. Um, I practiced for a while. After that, I uh, operated or co-founded my own law firm. I continued my practice areas in both intellectual property and um, 
pro bono services for nonprofit organizations. Um, did that for a while, gained a lot of insight in um, licensed resources as a, a law firm uh, owner and the costs associated with that. And of course, searching as a law practitioner. Um, eventually, I um, looked into other opportunities and ways that I could use my degree and an opening turned up at my uh, at UCLA Law School for a position as a, an assistant director in one of their um, clinical programs. So I went to work in the library at UCLA, UCLA um, and just fell in love with that. So I actually worked into my library degree backwards. Um, so I had my law degree first and then obtained my library degree. And like Scott, I'm a member of the alumni community where I, um, I also uh, received my degree here at iSchool. Um, here at iSchool, I teach, in addition to 203, I teach Info 220, which is uh, legal resources. And I also teach Info 244, which is my online searching course. So both of these are very helpful legal resource resources. We cover um, skills and techniques in performing um, legal research um, and give background into types of law libraries, ranging from an academic library, public law libraries, um, corporate settings, um, and so forth. And online searching, we do a broad um, overview of uh, developing advanced and sophisticated search techniques using a variety of sources. And I have kind of an old school approach starting with dialogue. Um, as I learned many years ago, and I still believe it to be true, if you can learn to search on dialogue, you can really learn to search on any platform. <laughs> so, um, in terms of careers in law librarianship, um, if we wanna go to the next slide, some, some of the highlights I wanted to mention, and this touch, touches upon things that um, both Scott and Crystal have already mentioned, and that is um, really the flexibility in job postings and not disqualifying yourself. So in the past, law librarianship was fairly strict in requirements of educational qualifications. That is increasingly becoming less the case. Uh, more and more you are seeing that a law degree is not required um, for academic law positions and other law librarian settings. So um, definitely don't disqualify yourself. I had a student last semester who had no library experience, no legal experience and just because a job posting looked interesting to her she applied for a position at um as a research librarian at a um judicial um or a court law library so uh, she got an interview she got a call back i haven't heard if she got the job but it just goes to show you you don't disqualify yourself because you never know a lot of it is are you a right fit for that position and the environment. Um, in terms of trends in recent years, we've seen a 55% increase in academic law library postings. And that's for a number of reasons. Some is retirement of law librarians and others is just the growth of the field. So you're seeing lots of variety in positions, new types of positions in emerging areas. Um, so I encourage you to check out Handshake that Sheila mentioned earlier and also things like the um, American Association of Law Libraries. Um, they have a job finder website that you can um, search to find um, positions that might be of interest. So again, there's a decreased requirement of a JD and MLIS degree for reference positions, particularly in an academic setting. And there's also emphasis on increasing diversity in the position and removing barriers to the pro profession. Um, in terms of your job search, again, be creative and think beyond brick and mortar libraries. More and more we're seeing hybrid positions, so um, remote or hybrid remote positions. Um, also things aren't always classified as librarian or information specialist. Um, so be flexible in your search terms when you're looking for jobs. Um, 
some some terms that Crystal mentioned are things like um, knowledge analyst and um, other you know unique areas, including law firms or other types of information environments. Um, also, touching upon what Scott mentioned is don't um, discount the experience and both the educational experience, your life experience and your work experience and how that can relate to a job that you're posting for. All of your skills and experience have transferable value. So you want to market your unique skills and experience to align with the job posting and requirements. Um, also, just take time to make personal connections with the people that you're interviewing. So a lot of it is about personality fit as well as those experiences and uh, both your um, educational background. Um, again, read those postings to identify key qualifications, take key courses to fill in any knowledge gaps, and um, also just some tips for interviewing to practice with a friend and provide concrete specific examples about how your work and education and internship experience can relate to the position you're applying to and always be able to speak to why you're a good fit and why you're applying. Um, equally important is asking questions of your potential employer because you wanna make sure that they're a good fit for you too. So it's uh, oftentimes just as important to interview the employer as they are interviewing you. Um, I did provide a link to a handout. So this last, uh, in the last few months, I um, hosted a uh, roundtable discussion with various um, experts in uh, legal careers. Um, so I've posted some links of resources that you might find helpful. And I'm always happy to answer questions if you do have an interest in law librarianship, um, courses that you can take that might be of value, and also um, technological skills that are highly valued as well. So I thank you all for your time and never hesitate to reach out if you have any questions that I can answer. All right, such great pro tips from all three of our panelists, and we appreciate all the time that you spent going through all the content from your courses, as well as your wonderful tips. Now we get to um, go into our Q&A, and if you folks have a question um, for any of the panelists, it's helpful if you can let us know in the Q&A who, um, who you'd like to address your question or if it's for everyone. And then I'll go ahead and moderate that. And um, uh, just starting with Jennifer, yes, um, you can email me for a copy of the slides and then also once um, this recording gets placed on um, our YouTube playlist, I'll go ahead and try to link in the description to the um, to a PDF copy of the slides. But if you need them right away, you could email me um, for those. Okay. So um, the next question is for um, Vicki Steiner. Um, the question is, I have a law degree from overseas, master in law and master, uh, sorry, I have a law degree from overseas, master in laws and master in international politics. I wonder if those degrees will be useful to compensate the requirements for the JD. So Vicki. Yes, absolutely. I would say so, um, Chandara, and congratulations on uh, obtaining your degree overseas. Um, Definitely, there are there is growth in um, foreign and international law librarianship, both in academic settings. Um, but I would say that that background of your law degree overseas would be of value. As I mentioned, the JD degree is um, it, it does still play a role, but it's not um, disqualifying in a job application. So. Um, your experience in obtaining your degree would um, be of value to employers in various um, job settings. So yeah, I would definitely encourage you to uh, check out the job postings. A lot of it is don't just focus on the educational ex experiences, but also look at the other requirements. And like Scott mentioned there, or Sheila mentioned, it's, it's, um, it's a wish list. So, um, you know, Think of how your uh, experiences can uh, meet 
those different criteria. Um, but yeah, absolutely, that degree would be a value. Um, and I can also link you up if there's a specific type of legal um, area that you're interested in, you can always reach out to me. I know a lot of people working in different types of law libraries or legal environments. So I'm always happy to um, connect people. Law librarians uh, love to mentor. So if you are looking for somebody in a specific type of law library, um, either I can help you if it's in the academic area or the law private law practice area, um, I can certainly help but if there are other um, settings that interest you, I can connect you with people who would be great mentors as well. Wonderful. Okay, our next guest is asking, if I'm looking for remote positions with salaries over 100,000, would you suggest focusing only on law and corporate environments? I guess that's for everyone on our panel. Um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I guess from my perspective, my answer would be no. I, I would I would look far and wide, <laughs> to be quite honest. Um, partly because I think you're getting similar positions, kind of information related positions in a variety of different sectors, whether it's government, law, medical, um, you know, special, whatever that might be. I know those are all somewhat special libraries, but um, certainly I think on the government side, you are potentially going to find positions that are going to have those kinds of salaries as well. And I think if you're looking, um, I mean, increasingly states are passing laws where the, you know, the salary has to be posted. You know, you're more and more of that. And I'm honestly surprised at some of the salary levels of some of the positions that I'm finding across different different areas, my perspective. I agree. And you know, law certainly is an area where you you would be looking at a salary in that range, um, depending on the type of legal environment. Yeah, and uh, I I concur with with my colleagues here. Um, I do think that you would want to look far and wide because there may be uh, very interesting opportunities ar around the globe uh, that could provide that kind of salary. So it just depends. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, let's turn to the next question. What does the standard workday look like for you in your current or most recent position? Great question. Maybe we can start with Scott again and go in the same order. Sure. Um, gosh, <laughs> standard workday. Um, uh, <laughs> the way the position is and the and the areas of responsibility that I currently cover, I'm typically jumping between a lot of different projects, um, and partly because of the work environment that I'm in, I have some flexibility as far as my work hours. So I am a morning person, so I, I am up early and typically I am doing my most intensive work at that time. So that might be a research project, it might be doing some analysis, um, you know, depending if there's not something like that, it might be because it's a global company, I'm answering questions from across the globe. So uh, EMEA is typically, uh, you know, Europe, Europe is typically uh, finishing up their day at around that time. Um, the Asia Pacific region is typically coming on later in my afternoon. So um, my day can sometimes get a little long, um, but generally, I mean, you know, there, there are some pieces that are more on demand and urgent and some that are kind of ongoing projects. So for me, what, what is becomes really critical is time management and making sure I'm kind of focusing and prioritizing where I need to need to prioritize. I don't know if that gives you a good sense, but that's kind of what what a typical day looks like. Okay, and so I would say that there is no typical day. Um, <laughs> You know, just following along with the same with, with what Scott was sharing, every day is different and unique. And that's one of the special things that I love about special librarianship. Uh, you walk in and there's an emergency. And so, you know, you think you've got your day set and you know what's what's coming. And then somebody comes in and says, I've got a meeting in one hour and I need to know X, Y and Z help. And so you drop everything and you do what you need to do to help 
this individual or, or team or whatever it is and, and different, that doesn't happen every day, but I'm just sharing with you, these kinds of things do happen. And, uh, you know, so there really isn't a typical day, but there, it, there are a lot of different things that you do and that you learn every, every day you're learning something new because you're doing something different. So that, that's my response on this. <laughs> Yeah, and that is a great question. So I'm a full-time instructor here at iSchool. So teaching is occupies most of my time here with the um, three courses that I teach. Um, when Before I did come work here, um, my work was at the law library um, where I was a reference librarian. So like Crystal mentioned, at, every day was day one. So every day presents new challenges. So you, it, it, it's great because you would get, have different experiences working with students, public patrons, faculty, um, the um, directors of programs, the deans of the law school who are looking for competitive intelligence about developing curricula. Um, so lots of variety and you never get the same answer or the same question twice, which makes it a lot of fun as well. So um, I think that's true of a lot of uh, positions in libraries, but especially special libraries. Um, okay, thank you. Okay, the next question. Um, hello, I have an interest in project management, and I was wondering if anyone has any advice on how to apply an MLIS to this. I'm hoping to maybe look into Google and see if they have positions, but I don't know where else to look. Are you, are you, I, I think I need some clarification on this. Are you looking to work in a in a project management organization, or do you want to use your project management skills in librarianship? Because if it's the latter, there is there is always the opportunity to use project management skills as a special librarian. Uh, you will actually have, uh, in many situations, you will have the opportunity to work on cross-functional teams that are doing things that are outside really the scope of librarianship, but they want your librarian skills as a part of that team uh, skill set. And so you'll be working on different projects. Um, and so it just it just depends. I mean, it, it's hard for me to, to say that's going to happen in every special library because it won't, but it will happen in many. Okay, great. Are there other panelists that wanted to um, address that or? I would just reemphasize what Crystal said. I mean, project management is a fantastic skill set that you can bring to pretty much any position, whether it's MLIS related or not. And, you know, there have been, I can think of, you know, in ca academic corporate um, public library settings where bringing that skill set to it is going to make you a very valuable asset for that organization. So. Okay, great. I guess we'll go to the next question. Okay, so for anyone working or having worked in the academic sector, what skills necessary do you think are needed to secure a job in this field? This is for roles not in research. So I think they're asking um, if you came from an academic library setting, what skills would transfer into special libraries? If I'm not mistaken, I think that's what the question is asking. I'm glad this is I'm glad this question was posted because one thing I didn't mention is uh, not all positions in law librarianship that are currently in demand are in public services or reference type work. So there's a lot of um, uh, opportunities um, in cataloging, web usability, you know, IT type areas. Um, that are available. So um, it's really just looking at those job postings. Um, some of the skills necessary um, aside from research would just um, be familiar with um, technology tools that are used. Um, uh, also, I would say, um, you know, just think of the tools that you use as a student at iSchool. There's different tools you use for presenting, um, for compiling information, doing research or teaching, um, and all of those um, tools are valuable in myriad contexts in academic librarianship. Um, 
So a lot of job postings in or job interviews in an in academic setting require a presentation of some time uh, of some some type. So having um, skills that enable you to create an effective pre presentation and and deliver it um, can be helpful, just like you're doing as a current student. Great advice. Um, pa other panelists, other things to add, or shall we move to the next? Okay, I'm gonna mark that one as done. Okay, um, the next question is, uh, if looking to be a medical librarian, what topic of Info 287 would you recommend? Um, unfortunately, our professor that teaches the medical library um, Topics is not with us today, but that would be Info 220 topic, Medical and Health Sciences Librarianship. Um, we also have Consumer Health Librarianship, which is a one unit, and we even have a health uh, healthcare informatics from our informatics side of the house that you could um, possibly take if you're interested in um, using that towards your electives. So I hope that helps. Next question, what is the most unique job you've had or come across in this field that most people wouldn't know about? I can name a couple that I've seen, not experienced. Um, one, this was this was formed a while ago. Uh, I went to UC Santa Cruz um, in, for my undergrad and um, I think one of the most interesting jobs was they had a Grateful Dead archivist uh, who who was curating all of this immense collection of Grateful Dead memorabilia for the for the university there. Um, that's one. The other one that I think continues to be interesting, and and not to put too much of a story on it, but um, I used to live in Longmont, Colorado. There used to be a company there called Digital Globe, which was involved in the whole chain of launching satellites for um, space photography, for, for GIS photography. Um, and they would sell their, their images to Google. They got bought by a company called Maxar, um, which still is based there. But it's fascinating because it is this very space-based company, very kind of you know exploration technology oriented, but they would regularly have positions listed that were you know, what you might consider traditional library positions, um, folks who are doing data management, who are doing image management, all of those kinds of things. So it was this, and you know, none of those ever showed up on any of the, the uh, library listservs as far as I know. Um, and so it's really fascinating position. Uh, I think there's some really, really interesting things out there. I'll share one, and this is actually a paper that one of my current students is writing. So I'm very curious to learn more about this, but she's studying about the librarianship at seed world seed libraries. Um, you know how uh, around the globe we have different places that seeds are being stored for um, posterity. <laughs> And so she is exploring those librarians. And I thought, how fascinating is that? That's certainly something I'd never heard of. Pretty cool. I'll just piggyback on this one is um, you, you folks can check out our community profile series. And um, we often have some very interesting um, interviews with our students who've gone on to work. There was one, uh, someone worked for a dance um, archive of dance. Um, so we're on the East Coast. We've had uh, zoo registrar. Um, there's a lot of different um, alternative environments, so you can try to check those out. Um, the next one is for Crystal. Can you speak more about the difference between information management and knowledge management? Okay, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> About <laughs> 10 minutes. <laughs> I'll, I'll be brief. But, uh, and I would be happy if, if you would like to uh, reach out to me, I can go on and on about this. But for, for the benefit of everyone, a real quick description is that information management is information, you, you know, such as in, in books and in journals and, and content that has been pulled together um, for our use. Knowledge management 
is actually in people's heads. So we have both tacit, uh, you know, information that we need to pull out of their heads <laughs> and capture. And so it's it's the same sort of a lifestyle where or life cycle where we want to capture it, store it, organize it manage it and make it easily accessible for reuse so that it can be used again and again and added to to create new knowledge over the future. So we're not just talking about content in these in these materials that that we're used to working with. We're talking about gathering what people have created their, themselves with their own knowledge by reading things and their own background and coming up with new ideas, that's knowledge. So I hope that's a super quick um, understanding between the two. And again, please reach out to me because I love to go on and on about this. <laughs> so Crystal, what kind of um, context or or subject areas would the knowledge management skill set be used? Would that be mostly in like scientific or academic settings or corporate? So I'll tell you, knowledge management can be used in any kind of an organization. And here's a very simple explanation. Think about a restaurant. Okay, we've got waiters and waitresses and busboys, and we've got somebody, uh, the hostess and the owner and the cooks. And if everybody really understood what each other's job was, think how much better their whole system and structure would be within that organization. And so if they had some basic processes in place in order to capture, well, this is what this person does. This is what this person does. This is what we do when we have X, Y, and Z issues. How do we help? That, that's a very simple but easy way to understand how knowledge management can be valuable in really any kind of setting. That's absolutely fascinating. And thank you for breaking that down for us. I got it. <laughs> I hope everyone else does too. Okay, let's move to the next one. We have two more open questions. Um, the next is from Anonymous. I'm curious if medical librarian pathway is different from the ones already mentioned as far as classes go in the program. Um, well, since we don't have our medical library um, specialists with us today, do any of our pathway advisors have any? Um, tips about this? Nothing that might be potentially harmful. <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't be potentially harmful. So I mean I, I mean, I'm guessing that maybe a background in life sciences, health sciences would be valuable in this subfield. I mean, I, I think that's a fair statement for any kind of specialization area that you're going into, but I don't know that it's absolutely necessary. Um, but I'm, I'm not as familiar with the, the medical library and offerings via San Jose State, unfortunately. Okay. And so, folks, we did mention um, Info 220, Medical and Health Science Librarianship, and Info 220, Consumer Health Librarianship, with, which is a one-unit um, elective option. So um, we can take a look at that if you want to um, sign up for an appointment with me and we can go through the pathway together. Okay, let's go to the next question. What is the most important piece of advice you can give to someone just starting out in the MLIS program and still figuring out what career they want to pursue? That's a great question to, to end, uh, end us up with. That's a great question. I always say um, one of the very best things you can do is have an open mind. And one of the luxuries of being a student is the having the opportunity to explore new areas of study that you may not have considered. Um, when, when I was a student, I really gave myself the freedom to pick courses that you know, I, I already had my job at the UCLA Law, Law Library, so reference was a natural um, pathway for me to take, but I pushed myself to go beyond what was traditional in the area in which I was working. And it was one of the best things I did because um, it, it 
does aid in making you that much more marketable because you get a different skill set that might make you stand out. Um, that could be things like web design or um, other areas of the career. So you never really know what might strike your interest when you're working through the program. And you might be surprised. Um, you might take a class and find yourself going in an entirely different direction than you originally intended. So just be flexible and um, enjoy the opportunity to um, pursue new things. Do you want to go, Crystal? Or? Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, uh, you know, essentially, my comment is ditto. <laughs> that was exactly what I was going to say: is stay, stay open, and stay curious. And um, you never really know what might strike you. And the same applies to your career as well: is you might be going in one direction and start doing something or get involved in something that takes you in an entirely different direction. And so, um, you know. I think one of the things that especially resonates with me with what Vicky said was building that skills portfolio that you have and that experience set that you have. Um, uh, you just you never know when you'll be able to bring those skills forward in your career as you as you continue on um, and just make yourself kind of more um, more employable in so many different ways for want of a better word um and it's you know it's just it's great learning so i'll stop so okay so i was gonna say what they said but i'm gonna tell you something different because <laughs> um i think that you should ask as many questions as you can while you're in school and take advantage of the fact that you are a student and this is a great time to reach out to practitioners. Um, you could reach out to, you know, say you do want to be, you know, you're, you're, you think your dream is to be a Disney librarian. Well, reach out to one and, and you know, say, I'm a student. And, you know, can you spare me 15 minutes to talk about what it's like in, in your environment? And, build, and make that connection. And I know it's really hard to do that, but as a student, I gotta tell you, 99% of practicing librarians in all, all kinds of librarianship are more than happy to talk with students. We're librarians, we wanna share information. <laughs> we want you to be uh, one of us. And um, we're excited that you are soon going to be one. So please keep that in mind. And I, and I do recommend talking with all kinds of the, the different professors and different practitioners and to help you really understand what direction you really wanna be in. Okay, well, I see that we have no more open questions. I'd love to thank our co-moderator, Taryn Reiner from the student services team, as well as all three of our um, excellent professors and faculty advisors. Our, all of the panelists um, gave up some of their lunch break today to spend time with you. So we really wanna say thank you for that extra support for all of our students looking to plan out their programs. Again, our recording of this presentation will be available uh, on our playlist. That's the iSchool Student Services and Outreach playlist on our school's YouTube channel. May give us a couple of weeks. Um, and you'll be able to visit all the other recordings of the other Pathway uh, webinars that we have done. And we look forward to planning the next one with you in the fall. So thanks a lot, everyone. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you for organizing this, Sheila. Of course. Thank you, Sheila. Thanks, Vicky. Thanks, Crystal. Thanks, Taryn. Yes, thank you too, Scott and Crystal. Have a great day, everybody. And Taryn. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Have a great day. Bye-bye.